Welcome to Pastor Sean as he gets ready to preach. Amen. Amen. Well, family, I'm so, ga- uh, so glad that you're gathered with us tonight. And uh, we're going to continue in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and uh, open them up and turn to the passage with me. We're going to reread it again, and we're going to continue um, in this two-part series. Now, last week, we focused on uh, three of the uh, initial gifts that are listed. We're going to walk through the rest of the gifts, and my big idea last week um, was all about the idea that the gifts have been given uh, for the uh, building up of the body of Christ, that gifts have been given not to glorify people, but to glorify God and to build up the body of Christ. And so today we're going to talk a little bit more about that purpose as we dive into the gifts. So let me give you my big idea for tonight as you've turned to 1 Corinthians 12. We'll be in the first 11 verses. My big idea tonight is more apparent, not more present. More apparent, not more present. See, the Holy Spirit is always present in and among Christians. And Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, uh, he may abide with you forever in John 14, 16. However, sometimes the Spirit's presence is more apparent to us than at other times. He chooses to what we call manifest himself, that is to make himself obvious to us. However, we should never think of the Holy Spirit as like more present when he's manifested through the gifts. The Holy Spirit is always present. God is omnipresent. He's in all places at all times and has been promised to the soul of every believer. But he is more apparent when these manifestations, these miraculous gifts, these acts are being done in and through his will. So let's talk a little bit about it tonight. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12 verses 1 through 11. And it goes like this. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts. Look to your neighbor and say different kinds of gifts. But the same spirit, now tell them the same spirit, distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So tonight, here's my main point. I want you to understand that the gifts of the Spirit are given to individuals for the benefit of the community. Given to individuals for the benefit of the community. So let's begin to talk through some of these incredible spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us. The first one that's listed after faith is the gift of healing. Now, the gift of healing is the supernatural manifestation. Remember, we said manifestation was made apparent, not more present, of the Holy Spirit of God that miraculously brings healing and deliverance from a disease and or an infirmity. What I mean by that is that not all diseases or infirmities are physical. Some diseases and infirmities are spiritual, mental, emotional, and relational. Now, here's what I want you to understand. These gifts that we are given, they're not a magic trick. Can I get an amen? And they are not to be done for anyone's glory 
other than the glory of the God that we serve. Therefore, Paul tells the church that the purpose of spiritual gifts is to edify other believers and ultimately to glorify God. See, God gives these gifts for his use, but in the Corinthian church, you know what they were doing? They were using them as a status symbol or indicating their spiritual superiority. So as we look at these truths, what we want you to understand is that God always gets the glory. Look to a neighbor and say, God gets the glory. Now say it to the person that you made it weird with because you've been ignoring them all night as you've been talking to that other person. God gets the glory. Now, the Bible then mentions miraculous powers. Now, I'm not talking about uh, powers that were given to like the avatar or anything like that. Um, but in the Greek, uh, dynamis, it's an act of power. It describes when the Holy Spirit chooses to override the very laws of nature. Well, what do I mean? See, the, the gift of healing and the work of miracles often operate in conjunction with that gift of faith. As seen in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, when through Peter, a paralyzed man at a beautiful gate, is walking for the very first time, though he was crippled even in his mother's womb. See, these things are not done on the whim of an individual or mustered up by an incantation. They are done by way of the prompting of God mixed with the faith of his people that people might know that he is the God that heals. Can I get an amen? You see this in Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, when Paul is in Lystra and somebody who had never walked stands up, but they don't just stand up, they leap to their feet. They, they not only begin to walk, but they begin to jump. A person that was crippled their whole life is not able just to walk, but to jump. And God defies the very laws of physics. You see it when Jesus walks on water or when Pastor Sean and Larry went to the Philippines and we met a man that was in his 80s that was born crippled, got out of a wheelchair that was made out of a plastic lawn chair with bamboo wheels and walked for the first time and for hours on end could not stop but dance around and praise God for his glory and his honor and his praise. So then what is prophecy? Well, Prophecy means to speak forth, to speak forth or to declare the divine will of God, to interpret the purposes of God or to make known in a way the truth of God, which is designed to influence people towards God. Now, let me, let me give a little bit of clarity here because I think often we live in a generation where we have confused the gift of prophecy as foretelling or fortune telling rather than its original intended tended purpose which was forth telling now what's the difference between forth telling and foretelling see forth telling is all about proclamation it's all about truth it's all about saying this before God comes and meets you in this moment let me tell you about the God that is about to meet you but foretelling is about predicting and coming up with ideas. Listen, you don't eat certain tacos at a certain time and then get the gift of prophecy. You get God in a moment wanting to reveal himself to somebody because he's come to do something. Therefore, he uses a vessel that he has filled to foretell, I'm about to do this thing. See, the gift of prophecy is not a psychic hotline that you tap into to get the things that you want or the things that you think you need. It's a moment of deep revelation that reminds us that we need God above all things. We need God above all things. So what about the distinguishing between spirits? Like Pastor Sean, what is the Bible talking about? Well, the distinguishing between spirits is the ability to distinguish between true and false doctrine, what is of the Holy Spirit and what's not of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk a little bit about it. See, what happens is some people have taken this and they've tried to say, well, this is only preaching. This is all it is. You get up in front of people and you preach a word to them. But in the original language, what you find is that there's a Greek word for preaching 
And there's a Greek word for divinely inspired speech. And the word that Paul uses here is not preaching. It's distinguishing divinely interpreted speech. Spirit anointed preaching is needed. Can I get an amen? Amen. But God will also use this spontaneous gift of prophecy. And it is also good preaching. When somebody walks up to you and teaches you the word of God by way of revelation that you needed to hear in a moment, it is just as good as a platform that you walked into tonight. Let me help you understand that God needs you to understand when it's him and when it's not. Because the Bible says that there are spirits and there is an enemy that's gonna try to pretend to be him in your life. So what about speaking in tongues? Okay, let's get down to the nitty gritty. Are you guys ready? Speaking in tongues, the thing everybody is freaked out about, right? Can we just break the ice and be honest? See, speaking in tongues is a personal language of prayer that's given by God, whereby the believer can communicate with God beyond limits and knowledge and understanding that come from the human language. Now, let me, let me teach for just a second. Are you all following with me? You guys walking with me in this? Okay, let, let, me, let me teach for a second. Now, tongues and prayer language is an important part of your devotional life with God but it is a very tiny and small part of the corporate administration of the church gathering. If you wanna learn more about this, look into 1 Corinthians 14 and you can follow along with me. Especially in public meetings, we are not going to regularly be practicing from the pulpit speaking in tongues. This is why. Because it needs to be carefully administered And it needs to be given an interpretation, not just by a person, but somebody filled by the Holy Spirit. This is what 1 Corinthians 14 teaches. See, the ability to pray in tongues is not given to every believer. Despite what many churches would teach, I would encourage you today that the evidence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is not speaking in tongues. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is found in Galatians 5. It is the fruit of the Spirit being produced in and through your life. So what we've done with this gift is we've made people act like they can use a gift that God hasn't even given them in the first place. So I need you to understand this. Now, what I don't mean is this. I don't mean that you're never going to be hearing anyone speak in a language that you don't understand at Light and Life. Number one, we're a church of many heart languages. Not everybody speaks Spanish or Khmer, and not everybody understands a personal prayer language. And let me tell you, we have some worshipers at Light and Life that are expressive and that love Jesus. Can I get an amen? So if I'm going to shout to God in English, sometimes my prayer language is going to come out and you are going to hear things that you may not understand, but it is not going to be given to you as a point of revelation. It's going to be given from me or the person speaking to God to glorify God and God alone. Let me encourage you. We will be a church that uses all the gifts And we will be a church that does not seek to misuse any of the gifts. So let's talk about the interpretation of tongues. If God is going to do that in our church, somebody had better be there that knows what that person is talking about. I don't care what heavenly language it is. I don't care what prayer language God is giving it better be stirred in somebody else's heart an understanding or here's what I'm gonna say to you. Don't come to me with it, keep it to yourself, okay? So let me ask you, have you been questioning the gifts? We talked a little bit about it last week. Here's some questions I wanna get to. I think many people question the gifts because they've been taught improper theology and doctrine about the gifts, So let's ask some questions. Let's kind of walk through some statements. Are the gifts no longer given to the church today? Some people would teach that the church no longer needs the gifts because all revelation 
has been given. And let me encourage you, that is a misunderstanding of the purpose of the gifts in the first place. The primary purpose of the gifts is not revelation, though it does bring revelation about God. The primary purpose of the gifts is because God loves you. God loves you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to heal you. He wants you to know that he's present. He wants you to know that he's near. So what does he do? He builds up the body with the gifts. You don't need the gifts to believe in Jesus, but you have the gifts to remind you that God is there. There is no evidence, listen to me church, there is no evidence from the scriptures that at any point the gifts of the Holy Spirit ceased. There's no evidence from the scripture that we no longer need the gifts of the Spirit. And here's why, let me go to the next statement, because we cannot remove some gifts and not other gifts. What we do is we begin to do the very thing that the Corinthian church was doing. We play favorites with the gifts of God. Those same preachers that would tell you, God does not do healing miracles. People do not speak in tongues, would say, but I am anointed with the gift of teaching, so sit down and listen to me. See, some teachers do this. They divide the gifts into different categories. So they create gifts that are communicative or administrative, and some are just miraculous. No, let me tell you right now that every gift that you've been given by God is a miracle. The fact that I'm standing here tonight and preaching the word of God to you is a miracle by the living God. There are a couple people that knew me in here before I knew Jesus. Let me tell you, it is a miracle. So we have to take all the gifts together and not divide them by ones that we like and that we don't like. The third is this. What does the Bible say about the continuation of gifts? Well, let me encourage you in Mark 16, verses 17 through 18, Jesus made a simple and straightforward promise. He said that you will be given these gifts. Acts 2, 33 and 39 remind you that if you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive the gifts that come along with God's Spirit that is promised to you. 1 Corinthians 14, 12 reminds us that you should be zealous for the spiritual gifts and that it would edify the church. It would excel the move of God. See, the purpose of spiritual gifts, all the spiritual gifts, is to build up the body of Christ. And that remains today. I wonder if the church is not being built up because we've put a few gifts away. I wonder if the church is not being built up because we've said, those are scary, they feel like fire, we don't want them anymore. Where is the scriptural evidence that the gifts died with the apostles? Family, I wanna encourage you right now, we don't follow men, we follow the word of God. John 1.1 1, 1 reminds us, in the beginning was the what? The word was with, and the word, not this commentator was God. That preacher was God. We look to what God says. See, I think what happens is, and this is my fourth point, many people really do misunderstand the need for miracles. We have a wrong understanding of Hebrews 12, three and four, which says that God bore witness to the signs and wonders and various miracles by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The, the idea is that the only real reason miracles and gifts were given was to authenticate revelation and that somehow it's no longer needed because the Bible is written. No, let me encourage you that it wasn't just Moses and Elijah and Elisha and New Testament times where revelation is given. God is still revealing his truth to people and it always needs to go back to his word. So what about judges through Solomon? 
What about times where God does these miracles? Uh, here's the reminder. I want to encourage you that we are in trouble if we think the only purpose of miracles is to authenticate the revelation of Christ. Because here's what the Bible says in Exodus 7, Deuteronomy 13, and 2 Thessalonians 2. It says that false prophets can do miracles. So who are we following then? Are we of the same spirit? No, the Bible says that they are of a different spirit. So it's not just about revelation. So what is the primary purpose of miracles in the Bible? Not, not to authenticate God's messengers. Yes, it does some of that. But love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, long-suffering, self-control, those do the very same thing. See, the primary purpose of miracles was that you would know that God loves you and wants to meet your needs. See, the primary purpose of miracles is not so that we could uh, gloat and glorify ourselves that we could boast and say, look at how good of a Christian I am. Let me encourage you. God doesn't heal certain people because they prayed more than other people. God heals people because it's his will. And I would encourage you that God heals everyone. Sometimes he just does it right now. Sometimes he does it later. And sometimes he gives you the greatest healing. He takes you to be with him forever. See, we must understand, actually, in Matthew 12, 38 through 40, Jesus condemns those who seek to authenticate revelation by miraculous signs. What does he say? You've received your sign, the sign of Jonah. And in John 2, uh, 18 and 19, Jesus provided one miraculous sign. What was it? His resurrection. In John 6, with the feeding of the 5,000, what happened? People followed Jesus because they wanted to see miracles. And what does Jesus do? He rebukes them for it. He says, you have what you need. First Corinthians 1, Paul notes that the Jews request a sign, but it doesn't mean that they know the Christ. See, I encourage you tonight, miracles are an insufficient evidence of authentic revelation of Jesus. They can always be explained away by an unbelieving heart. Somebody that wants you to prove more or do more. John 12, 37 reminds us of this. But often gifts are given to remind you that God loves you when you feel unloved. Gifts are given to remind you when you want to give up that God doesn't want you to give up. I want to give you an example. There was one night, Esau, he knows this well. He prayed over me. I was ready to give up. I was tired. I was frustrated. You know how ungodly you can be when you're hungry and you're tired at the same time? And I remember Isai in the middle of a meeting saying, can I pray for you? And in my mind, I was like, no, you can't pray for me. I'm tired and I want to go to sleep. And I know how long you pray. <laughs> now you see how ungodly you can be, right? But, but God stirred me. He said, Sean, stay here. I'm about to show you that I love you. And Isai grabbed my neck <laughs> with power and authority. And I was like, bro, be careful. I slipped a disc. And he began to pray over me. And I felt what felt like a hot iron ironing out a C5 slip disc. And in that moment, I could move my arms and I could turn my head and, and it wasn't so that Isai could be glorified. It wasn't so that I could go like, wow, I am such a good preacher. That message must have been great. It was God saying, Sean, I love you. And I see you in the midst of your suffering. And I know you're in pain. And I want to help relieve you of that pain. And I want you to remember that you just preached that prayer changes things. So stop being impatient and trying to get home when I want people to pray over you, son. See, God was encouraging me and rebuking me at the same time. God was teaching me through spiritual gifts that though he was present, he wasn't apparent because of my attitude. And let me ask you, in what ways have you not allowed the spirit of God to be apparent? The last thing is this, 
What does Christian history show us? You know, I, I gotta be honest with you. I love reading books. I'm obsessive about reading books. I have a goal to read 50 books in one year. I've read, I've read 46 books, not ones with pictures, ones with actual words, 46 books in one year. And, and I read so many books where people love to talk about things that are in the Bible. And what I often find is people putting their own emotion or their own ideas into the truth of God. So I read things from great authors that write things like, by the second century, the apostles were gone and things changed. Or when the church appears in the second century, the situation as regards to the miracles is so changed that we seem to be in another world. But then I actually read Christian history and I look at Clement of Rome or Ignatius or Justin the Martyr or Irenaeus or Tertullian. And what I find out is that the existence of miracles are things that all these church fathers speak of and it's within the second century. Can I encourage you? Don't be afraid of what God wants to do. Don't be afraid of the fire of the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid of the history of the church that is moved by the power of the spirit of the living God, but do not play with fire or you will get burned. <laughs> I want to remind you that gifts are not for you to do what you want with. They are opportunities for you to do what God wants you to do. So let me challenge you. Let me challenge you with what Paul challenges Timothy with. Let me take it back to the word of God because I said this is where we are going to land when we talk about the spiritual gifts. I'm going to take you to 1 Timothy 4, 14 through 16. And I'm gonna challenge you, do not neglect the gift that is within you. The Bible teaches that everyone in here has a gift. The Bible teaches that if you've been filled by the Spirit of God and you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that now you have been given a precious gift beyond the gift of salvation that you might go and you might foretell that you might get in front of, that you might forth tell, that you might show God and say, listen, the one that can save your soul is coming for you. So don't neglect the gift that's within you. Can I just encourage you? Don't be afraid because people have misused gifts. God will deal with them. Don't be afraid because people have put away gifts. God will deal with them. Do not neglect the gift that is within you. But the question you're probably asking is like, well, Pastor Sean, how do I do that? How do I not neglect the gift? How do I know if I'm playing with fire or locking it in the closet? Let me give you three things that I think will help you. First Peter 4.10 reminds us, practice it. Simply ask, can I pray for you? You know, I wouldn't have got healed that night had Isai not asked that question. And many of us are afraid to speak up, but don't you remember this truth? The Bible didn't give you a spirit of fear. Jesus did not give you a spirit of fear. His Holy Spirit, his fa the Father that knit you together in your mother's womb, did not give you a spirit of fear. But what did he give you? Authority, love, and a sound mind. So practice. Don't be afraid to get it wrong and repent. But also pay close attention. Pay close attention. Matthew 5, 15 through 20, it teaches us, judge them by their fruit. Look to people that say they operate in the gifts and then look to the word and say, is this how the spirit operates? But the third thing is this, persevere. Don't give up. Do not grow weary of doing good. What does the Bible teach? Out of Galatians 6, 9. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Can I, can I just be honest with you? I think so many people don't use their gift because they didn't see what they wanted when they used it. 
God doesn't always want what you want because his ways are higher than your ways. His understanding higher than your understanding. Can I just speak to your heart tonight? God knows better than you do. That's why he's called the father. And let's be good children and say, God, your will, not my will. Your gift, not my gift. The way you want me to live it out, not the way I want to live it out. God, sometimes I wanna hide it, but Lord, you wanna show yourself. Sometimes I wanna play with it in a way that glorifies me, but God, it's not about me, it's about you. And then begin to learn, wow, those are people that say they're from our family, but they sure don't act like they're from our family. Don't give up, family. Continue in this truth. I wanna encourage you tonight that we will be a church that exercises every spiritual gift. But we won't be weird to be weird. We won't use them to be seen. We will use every gift for the glorifying and the building up of the body of Christ because that's what God has asked us to do. Because we believe that this thing is really real and that if God said it, he will do it. And we believe it when it says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means that if he healed people in the past, he wants to heal people today. That means if the lame walked in the past, the lame can walk today. That means if the blind could see in the past, the blind could see today. That means that the same God that raised Lazarus from the dead is the same God that raised you from the death of sin. Family, we wanna serve that God. We wanna live in that God. And we wanna stand centered on the truth of Jesus. We wanna exercise every gift, not neglecting anything that God has given us. Why? Because we love the Father that much. Imagine for just a second that you got your child the gift they always wanted. That's right, your child got the pony they've been begging you for. I don't know how you got money for a pony, but you got it. You got them everything that they ever wanted. Think about what your child wants most. You know, YouTube's ruined my son. He loves yo-yos. And he found out that there's a guy that made a $100,000 yo-yo. He said, Dad, I want that yo-yo. And I looked at him and I said, well, your heavenly father owns the cattle on a thousand hill, my son, but I'm not giving you a $100,000 yo-yo. I see how you treat the $10 one that I bought you. <laughs> but imagine you got them that $100,000 yo-yo. Imagine that God gave you an opportunity to give your child everything they ever wanted. And then they took it, put it in a drawer, and never did anything with the gift that you gave them. Now, let's rewind for a second and imagine that God gave that gift and he says, hey, son, daughter, I've given it for you so that you can do it this way and actually people will know that you're my son or you're my daughter and they will know that they're my sons and daughters if you do it this way. And we say, no, God, not your way, my way. And we break the gift as soon as God gives it to us. How disappointed would we be in our children? Then God in the same way is disappointed when we neglect the gifts that are within us. So practice, pay close attention. And family, can I encourage you? Persevere. Persevere through your doubt the first time you hear speaking in tongues persevere through your unbelief when you hear that somebody's been healed persevere through your anxiety and fear when you go I just don't have faith that God could do something like that and maybe just open up your Bible and turn to Peter walking on water and go if that son could do it yeah I bet God could do it in me but also remember that when he took his eyes off Jesus, he began to sink. Family, I wanna encourage you. 
God will move mountains for you. God will break the law of physics to bring a soul to him. But we need to look to Jesus because he's the only one who really knows how the gifts are supposed to be used. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? I wanna ask you a couple of questions to stir your heart. As you've been thinking through part one and now part two, as you've been processing, oh Lord, they're about to talk about gifts and Lord, I'm not certain. Is there anyone in the house tonight that is afraid in their heart that they might misuse a gift that God would give them without anyone looking around? Just raise up your hand. Okay, I see you. I wanna encourage you to raise your hand tonight that if God gives it to you, he already knows what's inside of you. If God gives it to you, he already knows what's in your mind. If God gives it to you, would you really challenge your father that you know better than him? Tonight, I pray that fear would begin to melt away from your heart and from your soul. I also wanna ask, is there, is there anyone that maybe you saw God move in a miraculous way and you were living in your gift, but because of hurt or unreception, pain, fear, whatever it was, you kind of put your gift in the drawer. You've been scared to take it out. If that's you, with nobody looking around, no condemnation in the house, would you just raise your hand? If you're online, feel free to say that's me. Thank you, God. Thank you for the boldness of your children. I just wanna say to you today that the great thing is that God cast that as far as the east is from the west. It's not about what you didn't do for him yesterday. It's about you saying yes to him right now. So God is speaking to you, son or daughter, say yes to me again. Lastly, is there anybody in this room that just feels like, you know what, God, I just, I, I wanna give up on the whole thing. I can't even begin to think about gifts because God, my, my life feels overwhelmed and I'm not certain I even know that you're present. I, I, I don't see you, you're not a parent and therefore because you're not a parent, I've began to believe in my heart, mind or soul that you're not present. If that's you without anyone looking around, could you just take a moment to be vulnerable before the Lord and say, God, that's me. He already sees you and he already knows, okay? Thank you, Jesus. Tonight, Lord, I speak this truth over your children as a reminder of the gifts of the spirit that you've given us. An evidence, Lord God, that you love us and you're for us. An evidence, oh God, that you're not against us. We've given all to you, Jesus. We've been given all the revelation that we need, but God, in the midst of hard situations, we recognize that we need you to show up, show yourself obvious, be apparent in a way that we don't always see you. We recognize our need for the gifts. And so right now I shift to begin to pray, God, give new gifts. God, in this moment, by way of your spirit, deposit gifts that are needed for the building up of this body, not for my glory, not for their glory, but for your glory. God, build up your body so that people would know that you are the living God, that our unborn brothers and sisters might meet you and find you and know you and submit to you. God, that the world might change and that we would get a little touch of our eternal healing right here and right now. Show yourself, Jesus. Show yourself, Father. Show yourself, Holy Spirit that we might know that the promise is true, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Tonight, oh God, you get all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, 
Amen. Come on, let's thank God for his presence tonight. Let me tell you, family, there are times where you just need to be taught certain things. There are times where we need to dig a little bit deeper into his word. I want to encourage you, if you are struggling with the gifts of the spirit, if you've been taught in a different way and you find yourself either putting it away or feeling afraid that you might be playing with a wildfire, I wanna encourage you, come find one of the pastors, come find one of the leaders, come talk to us, Alberto or Kimmy or myself or Joel, Larry or Deb. We'd love to encourage you and bring you back to the truth of God's word. Family, I encourage you, look not to man, but the person of Jesus. Hide the word in your heart so that the truth of the gift that you've been given might become more evident. Would you stand to your feet as I bless you tonight? Stretch out your hands in the posture of reception. Thank you, Jesus. By way of the Father, you have knit us by your work on the cross, you have redeemed us. By the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, you have filled us. Let us not neglect what is inside of us. May we practice, may we play, pay close attention, and may we persevere. May all that we do be for your glory, your honor, and your praise. In Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Bless you, church. Thanks for hanging out tonight. Do me a favor. Before you leave, find somebody you don't know. Ask them their name. Get to know them better. Then pick up.